On this episode of DTNS, did you hear? iMessage and Bing aren't that big of a deal. So say Apple and Microsoft. You might keep a keen mind later in life with more internet usage. And Patrick Norton is going to give it to us straight on our next soundbar purchase. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, September 5th, 2023. From Studio I Need a Soundbar, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. At the edge of the 314, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Shea. Well, after the holiday weekend in the U.S., we got quite a deluge of news. Uh, One of the things that came in kind of right before we started the show, the European Commission is set to appoint Belgium's Didier Reynolds as new competition chief. Marguerite Vestager has taken a leave of absence to run for head of the European Investment Bank. Now, on to the quick hits. Huawei and China's largest chipmaker, SMIC, built an advanced 7 nanometer processor for Huawei's Mate 60 Pro. Now, this is significant because Bloomberg News passed along specs from Tech Insights, which conducted a teardown of the Kirin 9000S chip that is in this new Mate 60. Huawei released the phone online last week, didn't offer any specifications on processor design or wireless connection speeds, although Tech Insights notes there are 5G speeds. The U.S. Commerce Department hasn't weighed in yet on whether uh, SMIC's supply of 7 nanometer chips to Huawei violates U.S. sanctions. Microsoft is rolling out an updated Xbox dashboard, which lets you stream your gameplay to Discord friends and also has variable refresh rate or VRR improvements for the Xbox Series S, excuse me, Series S and X consoles. Xbox new voice reporting feature is also included, as well as a new way to pair accessories to Xbox consoles. To better focus on investments, which means less focus on news, Meta has announced that is deprecating Facebook news in the UK, Germany, and France. Facebook news is the curated news sections for publishers with its own dedicated tab introduced back in 2019. But plans to further expand to India and Brazil have seemingly fallen by the wayside. Meta no longer seems to have the appetite for news as much as it is politically driven. And the fact that legislators recently have been pushing for sites like Facebook and also Google to pay news outlets for linking to their stories. Lionel Messi, heard of him? Big soccer star. The Wall Street Journal reports that MLS season pass, which Apple TV Plus has exclusive rights to, saw more than 110,000 new U.S. signups on July 21st when Messi had his first match playing with the Inter Miami. If you're wondering if that's a lot, Apple TV Plus saw 6,143 the prior day, (laughs) according to analytics company Antenna. This was a bigger jump than the day MLS season pass became available and on the opening day um, of the season. So oh, man. pretty big, pretty big. Jump. I don't, you know, we could talk about soccer, football all day. Uh, these were Ted pretty Lasso. big numbers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a huge difference. Yeah. On Tuesday, New York City, heard of it? <laughs> we'll start enforcing a 2022 law requiring short term rental platforms like Airbnb, Verbo and others to register with the city or face up to a 5000 per stay fine. An estimated 40,000 locations will now need to comply with the new rules, but as of August 28th, only 257 licensees have been issued to uh, licensees had got uh, gotten issued licenses. NYC believes that there are nearly 11,000 illegal listings in the city and that registering lawful hosts will be an uphill climb. And I think they're right. All right, Rob, let's talk more about uh, those little upstarts, Apple and Microsoft. Yeah, just itty bitty companies. Uh, you know, the Financial Times reports that Apple and Microsoft are privately arguing that neither iMessage nor Bing are big or powerful enough to just the Digital Markets Act or DMA restrictions. The European Commission is set to publish a list of companies, including Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, Meta, ByteDance, and Samsung on September 6th. That's today. But which Parts of the said company's business operations will be covered as not known, and Apple and Microsoft are fighting to keep iMessage and Bing free of the DMA's purview. Yeah, so the DMA is part of a suite of uh, EU laws 
designed to curb the power of tech companies that are too powerful or deemed too powerful by everybody else. Uh, everything that Rob mentioned, those are big companies, right? The Digital Services Act focuses on how platforms handle user data and moderation. It also went into effect in August. So we're seeing, you know, some of the first moves of this now. So, uh, Patrick, we're going to start with you here. Is iMessage in any way <laughs> exempt from this? <laughs> Um, you know, if iMessage was an independent product, something you purchase through the app store, um, sure. Uh, same thing for Bing. Uh, but because they're parts of Microsoft and, and Alphabet, I just don't see either one of these escaping regulation. Um, you know, the EU is, I think they are tired of playing catch up with regulation and they're just going to be like, hey, we're going to, we're going to put this up. You, we're going to deal with this up front. And uh, I, I'll be curious to see what happens, but, you know, any subset of Apple and Microsoft, you know, even if it's a rounding error for them, is still going to have tremendous influence because, hey, Microsoft makes its money off of Windows. It makes its money off of office licenses. It can start a new company and pour money into it. And it obviously has an impact on the market and the ability for companies to survive. I just, I see them getting slapped with the same rules that everybody else is getting. I might even say I'm okay with that. I mean, Rob, you and I were sort of uh, chuckling about this whole thing uh, before the show. I, w I would say that there was a time where Bing was not big or powerful enough uh, <laughs> based on competitors. Bing's in a pretty different position now. Mm -hmm. But I mean, Apple saying, oh, who even uses iMessage is just absolutely ludicrous. You have a lot of options, have a lot of options. But uh, but no, I it, this doesn't fly. Like every teen, yeah, <laughs> three quarters of the teens in North America. Yeah, um, iMessage. Uh, you, you know, Apple trying to get iMessage off the hook is laughable, especially when the CEO of Apple has recently said that if you want to use iMessage, buy your mother an iPhone. Yeah, um, right. it's like when well, you're making those kind of statements you can't you can't then go and argue oh well we're really not that big because we only have billions of people who use us not multiple billions of people who use us. i mean how many years has it been now that we talk about like ooh blue or green bubble if you're on a group chat i message breaks everything wouldn't it be nice if apple played you know uh, nicer with other standards we've been talking about this for a long time Apple knows yeah. what kind of market value it has and, you know, and how it is sort of kept many of us in the clutches. Whether we're fine with it or not, we're still there. I, you know, anytime you've got a company with $60 billion in relatively ready cash reserves, feel free to mock me for calling it ready cash reserves. But, like, they got $60 million sitting in a bank in New York by way of a holding company in Ireland. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it, the, the whole scale they compete at just justifies the regulation. And feel free to tweet at Patrick Norton and tell me that I am a communist and don't understand, you know, business. And, well, stuff. okay, so I guess, you know, <laughs> based on the this conversation that we're having, I mean, do we think either Microsoft or Apple will be successful here? I mean, they have big no. legal teams anyway. The, neither one is going to be. Uh, Bing is bundled with the most popular operating system on Earth. Right. They're not getting past that. iMessage is bundled and built into the most popular smartphone on Earth. Now, granted, there are way more Android phones out there, but... The hotness is iMessage. Just yesterday, yesterday, my daughter is telling me, Dad, I think I'm switching back to iPhone. Why are you switching back? Ah, I miss iMessage and FaceTime. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, those are the only two reasons that she's going to, you know, completely switch back to, you know, a different platform. So it's just, she just wants right. to get back to iMessage. So Apple has no shot here. And like I said, you know, Tim Cook, the stuff that he said about it, it I, you know, someone, someone's getting paid a lot of money to at least try to fight this fight, but it's it is it is not a winning a, a winning battle that yeah. I think that went through here. I mean, it's funny, right? Because you, I, I understand how they could argue that you know this isn't a gatekeeper. This is just something we bundle with the operating system. Um, you know, our app store, yeah, that's that's a gatekeeper. The operating system, that's a gatekeeper. But it's it's I you know I just you have to laugh anytime you hear. And even if they are right and prove so in court, you know, it's still just strange for them to be like, no, 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 we're so small, we're so tiny. We're not that important. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, but I can look, also look at all the WhatsApp users. They don't need us. It's like, 
well, I talked to Rob's <laughs> daughter who's like, you know, I kind of miss my friends. I want FaceTime and iMessage and the blue bubble. Yeah. I mean, it's really, you know, you look at the the rules, right? It's has a, the criteria will be met if a company has a strong economic position, significant impact on the internal markets, active in multiple EU companies, check. Has a strong intermediation position, meaning that it links a large user base to a large number of businesses, check. Has or is about to have an entrenched and durable position in the market, check. Meaning that it is stable over time if the company met the two criteria above in each of the last three financial years. So, you know, I feel like you have blanket coverage of both Microsoft and Apple just looking at the basic uh, criteria for the Digital Markets Act. Well, we'll we see. will be following the story. But meanwhile, Rob, tell us more about a study uh, that might make you want to stay online a little bit more. So, yes, a really interesting study of 18,154 older adults born before 1966 was published in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, showing that regular Internet users had approximately half the risk of dementia compared to their same age peers who do not use the Internet regularly. This difference remained even after controlling for education, ethnicity, sex, generation, and signs of cognitive decline at the start of the wow. study. Participants using the Internet between six minutes and two hours per day had the lowest risk of dementia. You just think about it. Six minutes to two hours a day, half. That, that, is, that is statistically significant. Now, if you I, go I, like two to four yeah, hours, does, the, does it do you start becoming more likely to have <laughs> <laughs> you're likely to post something on Facebook you'll regret. In all but, uh, cap. Yeah. Uh, no, this is this is actually kind of interesting to me, especially because we talk a lot and, and we have recently on the show because there have been a lot of studies on the younger set. And, you know, what is social media doing to the youth? You know, is it making you feel worse about yourself? Uh, you know, is it, it leading to depression, et cetera, et cetera? And that, that is all still, you know, really, really interesting stuff to study. But when it comes to older people who, uh, you know, have either propensity or already have dementia to be able to, I don't know, I guess, feel more in line with the uh, inner workings of the world, uh, that kind of surprised me, honestly. The study surprised me. I mean, there's... A history of dementia on one side of my family um, and some fairly dramatic and depressing stuff that came out of that. Anybody who's dealt with dementia, uh, you have my utmost sympathy and my thoughts are with you uh, if you're dealing with somebody right now because it's, it's utterly brutal, right? But it's kind of fascinating just the idea that, you know, this is good. You know what I mean? Your brain staying active. It's, it's uh, you know, it's not the only thing you want your seniors or yourself to be doing, but man, that's, that's a huge, huge, huge difference. Half the risk. I mean, what, <laughs> there's a lot of things I do to have the risk of heart disease or lung disease or cancer or, you know, of course. Uh, yeah. Tell uh, me so... what to eat. <laughs> Tell me what not to do. <laughs> you know, the kind of thing, uh, just a just a few more, uh, notes on the study. Uh, if you're interested, uh, the study author, Gowan Cho, uh, plus, uh, their colleagues were looking at the risk of developing dementia. So this wasn't necessarily how it can help people with dementia, uh, but also how it could stave off dementia. Uh, 65 or, uh, percent of participants were already regular internet users. 35 percent were non-regular users. Maybe they, you know, got online every so often type thing. 21 percent changed their internet internet use habits during the study period. 53 percent didn't. The remaining 26 percent either just dropped out of the study or maybe died during the follow-up period because they were elderly. Or they developed dementia during the study. 5% of participants developed dementia during the study period. 8% died or experienced another event due to which they were excluded from further analysis. So your mileage may vary, obviously, when it comes to this. It does seem, though, like preliminary numbers show that if you are uh, either experiencing dementia or maybe have some warning signs of getting there... Uh, to uh, to to be online, I guess not unlike 
reading a newspaper or, you know, I don't know, having somebody tell you the, you know, the, you know, the, the scenes of the day from the earth that you might not have ever heard about <laughs> otherwise, or maybe even watching television, you know, those all would contribute to you not feeling right. kind of alone and uh, your brain going to mush. I wouldn't well, be shocked if you would see phone makers and like the AARP here, here in the United States and other organizations similarly around the world, you know, no, knowing that the, you know, this study is so significantly impactful. I mean, half you use, a, you use your phone, you know, get on the internet for six minutes to two hours a day and your chances of getting dementia are, ha are cut in half. That, that is a promotable, you know, concept, you know, basically if you are a boom, baby boomer or older, use your phone regularly and it helps you, uh, you know, or keeps you from getting dementia. That that is something I think you're going to see branding and commercials around in the not too distant future. Yeah, I mean, when you look at some of the Alzheimer's sites, right? It's physical activity, uh, eating healthy, don't smoke, don't drink. You know, basically reduce your alcohol consumption and stay mentally and socially active. And it's kind of wow. I never would have. You know, we we always. And, and to go back to what you're saying earlier, Sarah, we we tend to think of cell phones as being isolating or this, you know, mm -hmm. gateway to doom scrolling and self hatred and you know it, whatever you want to ascribe to it. You know, I was on Instagram and now I want to you know stop eating for the next six months. Like it's always so peculiar. I think at this point when we realize that these can actually be positive tools um, for you know things other than routing around traffic in the middle of L.A. on a bad Tuesday. Um, yeah. I mean, it definitely you know. depends on, you know, who you're, 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 uh, <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. I mean, if you are looking at, uh, I don't know, self-harm stuff as a young person on Instagram, like not going to help you if you're, you know, 75 and older, but, uh, but there is something about, I guess, taking part in just I don't know the way that the world's still working and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and feeling like you're not left out. And I, I think, I think that counts for a lot. I mean, I feel like that way about myself. I know we're doing the show, so it's a little bit of a silly thing for me to say, but you know, when I'm, when I, when I check out, uh, too much, sometimes I do that for mental reasons. I also feel like, ah, I, you know, I, I lose a lot as well because you learn things online. True that. True that. Well, speaking of learning things, in this season of Know a Little More, Tom Merritt is going to break down a pivotal moment in tech history, which you might not have known about, the mother of all demos. How many technologies we use today that were introduced in 1968, and why it took over a decade for them to even go mainstream. All this season on Know a Little More, check out the Patreon page at patreon.com slash know a little more to find out a little more. I was going to do a salt and pepper voice and say, let's talk about sound, baby, which I just did, but it sucked. So sorry about that. Uh, I don't want to <laughs> make this weird. Bad. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Patrick, we are talking about sound bars, though, and... I'm in the market for one because I left my old sound bar at my old apartment because I just couldn't handle it anymore. And I want to know what the new hotness is. Oh my goodness. Okay. So sound bars are an easy and relatively inexpensive way to upgrade your TV sound. Their quality isn't the same for all types of models. Um, you know, I'm just going to lay out a few things here. One, the speakers in your TV probably suck. You know, as much as I love the acoustic service, audio, acoustic surface audio plus technology uh, that Sony builds into some of their OLED TVs where the screen actually there's a, you know, actuator that moves the screen and the screen actually has a speak. It is a speaker sending sound to you where you're staring. It's pretty glorious. Um, but generally speaking, TV speakers pretty much suck compared to speakers outside the TV, whether they're a pair of old gaming speakers, a sound bar, or a full-on 7.2.4 surround sound system with 11 speakers and a pair of subwoofers. Um, you know, it's, I also, in case anyone hasn't noticed, I am a, I'm a home theater nerd. I have a screen in the basement or the rumpus room or whatever you want to call it. So having all two speakers is perfectly fine for me. The four over the surround sound, you know what I mean? There's a lot of cables that have been pulled in my house and, uh, 
you know, my inner nerd is happy to hang speakers and run cable and tune the AVR and tune the room. And, and it's a hobby, right? A lot of people yeah. just want better sound without it being a hobby or paying a lot of money or they can't put speakers in the ceiling or they just don't want these giant boxes hanging out in whatever room the television screen is. Um, you know, there are advantages to discrete home theater speakers, right? You know, speaker, a center channel, left, right, and the rear surrounds, you know, especially the center channel is going to give you in some cases, clear vocals, a little more intensity, um, and more kind of space from the Atmos uh, immersive effects. A quality soundbar is going to get you alarmingly close to that with a lot less cable. And, you know, I'll just flat out say it sound is 50% or more of the experience. You know, if you're watching your favorite television program, if you're watching a new movie, um, it is amazing what sound designers have been doing and continue to do, especially with the object based audio and Atmos. Um, you saw, if you were watching the video, you saw a picture flash up a second ago and you literally have 128 channels of audio and that lower right hand corner, it's been essentially a box and you can steer the sounds around that box. Now, the other thing you can do, uh, that Netflix does, for example, is you may notice at the end of a Netflix, there's like a 20 minute video and three minutes of credits and like another 20 minutes of voice credits for people around the world. One of the things that uh, Atmos allows companies like Netflix to do is to swap out different sets of audio for different countries very quickly and easily, which is something you really couldn't do with traditional channels of audio. So in any case, when you get a sound bar, you're getting anywhere from a couple of stereo speakers that sit in front or above, or depending on how they're set up, your television set. You may get a six foot wide sound bar, maybe two and a half feet wide. It should have really at least three speakers. So it gives you a better center channel and then a left and a right channel. They come with discrete rear channels in some cases. There are a billion of them out there. Uh, Vizio is very famous for them. Uh, LG is doing them. Samsung's doing them. Polk Audio is doing them. Almost every major audio manufacturer has some variation on a sound bar. So for about 160 bucks, a really great entry level product to look at is Vizio's V-Series, the V5186. Uh, it's a 5.1.2 system. Basically, it has a big sound bar in the front and a couple of rear channels and a subwoofer. Um, you know, you're talking about thousands of four point something star reviews. It's about $250. And uh, the next gen, the follow up to that is the V51 XJ6. Uh, that's available at Amazon, you know, like four and a half stars, 5,146 reviews. That's that's something that people are really happy with. Is it the equivalent of $10,000 worth of surround speakers in an AVR? No, but it's really good. Now, the thing about those 5.1.2 systems, they aren't doing any Atmos. And Something, a, a nice upgrade from that that I've heard that's pretty impressive is Vizio's M series, the Elevate 5.1.2, uh, sports Dolby Atmos. Depending on where you're shopping, it's $500, $600. So, what it has inside of there is at the end of the sound bars, they call them adaptive height speakers, and they rotate up or forward depending on what you're listening to. So, rotated up, they behave like Atmos enabled speakers. They bounce audio off your ceiling for that immersive effect. There are a lot of uh, sound bars that are doing that where they have the, the uh, you know, Atmos enabled speakers. I will say your ceiling needs to be flat. It needs to not have a popcorn ceiling. It needs to not be a cathedral ceiling, um, you know, to get the the audio to bounce. And the reason kind of is because the the audio will just be bouncing in weird ways. Yeah, right? you basically, yeah, you want it to be like you know when you when you see somebody strike a a uh, a shot on a pool table and it hits the bumper and it ricochets like that's what you want the sound's going to go up it's going to hit the ceiling it's going to go down to where you're sitting mm -hmm. um when you have a you know if you have a cathedral ceiling it's going to bounce but it's going to go to the wrong place if you have a popcorn ceiling or a highly textured ceiling it's going to essentially diffuse it and diffusion yeah. is great if you're creating a recording studio it is not what you want if you're trying to get the uh you know the atmos uh, enabled speaker thing going for your surround sound so there is Rob, uh, like I what, said, what is your i know we were both talking about needing a sound bar what is your sound bar situation currently if there is any so uh two years ago i uh built this uh podcast studio and it, it's more than what you can see right now i've actually got you know couch and chairs and a nice big samsung 85 inch tv and I never hooked up good speakers and I never bought a soundbar for it because I very rarely watch TV. And what the reason is, because and I think you mentioned this uh, is is that, you know, Patrick, is that sound is probably half of your viewing experience. Well, up in my family room, I've got all the speakers. I've got everything up there. It's just when you're watching the movie, it's just way better to watch when you've got all that sound equipment. 
Um, down here, I would like to have more because what's going to honestly happen probably tomorrow, I'm going to have an accident and go buy an Xbox because I want to play Star, um, <laughs> you know, uh, this, this new game. So I want it to sound great. And like right now, I've just got the speakers built into the Samsung TV. The, the TV is beautiful to look at, but yeah. it sounds like you're listening on a cell phone, like an old cell phone when you're listening <laughs> to audio on it. So they're trying so hard, right? But you literally, as televisions get thinner, you have less and less volume to work with. And honestly, having some volume for your speaker enclosures makes it much easier to create better sounding audio. Um, you know, it, it's miraculous that your television sounds as good as it does, uh, but it still sounds pretty awful compared to even a set of 10 year old computer speakers you bought off somebody's yard sale. Um, I will say, uh, if you have some time, uh, Brent Butterworth uh, over at Wirecutter, he did a big, like he said, a blind jury testing. He did a big roundup this summer. This article went live in June. It's the best sound bar. Definitely worth taking a look at. Uh, has some options I haven't heard that he highly recommends. He is a very serious, uh, he is not an audiophile, though, you know, he, I could call him that. He is an audio professional and a member of the Audio Engineering Society. He's probably literally benchmarked more subwoofers than just by anybody else on the planet. Um, and he's going to, he's got some really nice suggestions in there. And there's a couple of great articles in there to think about for like what you're doing and how it works in your room and what your options are. And so there's some very, very good stuff over there. It's called the best sound bar over at wirecutter.com. Well, Patrick, we can't think of anyone better than you to tell us about what our options are. Thank you for all the <laughs> tips and let us all have better audio. Uh, and El Futuro. Hear all the experience. <laughs> That's right. It's true, though. You know, you can say, yeah. ah, yo, I don't really care. But once you have it, I, you go back. You know, I was like, I don't need an extra, you know, the, the 7, 9, 11, you know, with the multiple rear height channels. That didn't do a thing for me. I will say that the first time I heard a demo of Atmos uh, over at Dolby Labs, it was mind-blowing. Um, mm. You know, and immersive is a good word for it. It's like you're. If you haven't, well, if you haven't been to an Atmos theater, fine. And one. we've got it's some an Atmos experience. coming into TCL TVs uh, early next year, which will be kind of exciting. Uh, so we'll force you to come back and tell us more about that. <laughs> Deal. All right. Uh, over in the mailbag, feedback at dailytechnewshow.com is where to send those emails. Uh, this one came in from Andy. Uh, from the woods of New Hampshire. That's where Andy lives. Uh, Andy said, love the confusing acronym discussion in GDI 4595. Rob and I were talking about LOL. Sometimes it means lots of love, depending on who your parent is. Uh, Andy says, I work in emergency medicine, and I still run into LOL all the time in notes from dispatch in handoff reports from day to night shifts and on chart notes. Most commonly, it's LOL fall. Now, this is a fun, low-stakes example of the difficulty of acronyms in healthcare, and I frequently use it as a training topic. You might be like, what is Andy talking about? Well, uh, in this case, little old lady came in due to a fall. LOL fall. So, long, 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 long time ago, I actually was an EMT. Um, you know, um, like right at the end of college, right moving into uh, grad school. And this is actually something this story reminded me. I, I remember this, you know, LOL, uh, you know, little lady fall was something that was used way back in the, you know, in, in the mid nineties. Just yeah. To save time. It wasn't supposed to be like funny or kitschy. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Well, how about that? You know, we learn something new about you every day, Rob. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick Norton, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, let folks know where they can keep up with everything you know about soundbars and beyond. Oh, uh, boy. I'm technically still on the Twitters, which is, I guess, the X, which is a name I have difficulty saying because it's the name of my favorite band. And now I'm wandering off into a pointless digression. Uh, at Patrick Norton on Twitter, or uh, you can catch up with me at avxl.com or search for avxl on your favorite podcatcher. It's a podcast I do with Mr. Robert Heron. And patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet, where we'll talk about Google's new Android Fit. Oh, and what a fit it is. Just a reminder, though, we do the show live Monday through Friday. You can catch it live 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow. Scott Johnson joining us. Hope you can make it. Talk to you then.
This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>